Okay, so welcome everybody. My name is Sylvia, and I am representing the World of Reconnects Network. Thank you for joining us for the webinars and conversation cafe series, where we are offering a wide range of rich educational and supportive opportunities for our global community of World of Reconnects facilitators, members, and of the network. Our intention is to strengthen the, the web of the World of Reconnects community while continue, continually reaching beyond our current edges to weave deeper connections with others who are contributing to the great turning in diverse and complementary ways. And today we are going to present the webinar on, next slide please. Thank you. The webinar um, on guidance for emerging facilitators, a panel discussion with experienced facilitators. Um, we are going to be hearing from Helen. Helen is from China and she will introduce herself better. After this, we have Yuka from Japan and United States. And we have Molly, not just one of uh, the facilitators, but also one of the writers of the, um, oh, so I forgot the name of the book. Uh, um, coming back to life. Coming back to life. Thank you, Yuka. Um, and Molly is also one of the weavers in the network. So we are going to be having a conversation with the three of them. And um, we are going to be receiving questions from you and some of the questions that were posted previous to the webinar. Thank you. And we can take down the slide. Thank you. So we are now going in with Yuka, who has one um, meditation and grounding for us. Yuka, it's all yours. OK, thank you, Celebia. Hi, everyone. I'm so glad to see us gather together here in this moment, in this time of darkness. I'm sure you know what I mean. And today, as Sylvia said, all panelists are supposed to offer a meditation, some movement or music. So I would like to open our time together with this video, which shows one of my favorite practices from the work that reconnects. Okay. Here we go. So this is called the Elm Dance in almost all the retreat type workshops I've ever attended. The first thing we did in the morning was this dance. This dance helps me face the pain for the world because it reminds me that there are so many people all over the world doing this particular dance, working to heal the world. It feels good to know that I'm not alone. Unfortunately, we cannot hold hands today, but let's use our imagination and dance together with the circle in this video. Oops, do you hear it? No, right? No. Mm. no. You may have to stop um, the, sh the sharing and share again and include the, the sound. Okay. Sorry. Okay. We still cannot hear it. 
Yeah, it's a silent beginning. So okay, thank you. I hope you will hear it this time. Mm -hmm. song is particularly sad because it's from Latvia, which is uh, a country very close to Ukraine. Um, yeah, similar language. So thank you for that. And uh, welcome those who just um, join. We are going to start with introductions. And I, I would like to start asking, um, the facilitators about a little bit about themselves and how they came to the world that we connects. Um, the way that we are going to do this is a little bit different from the last webinar. Um, we are going to have a introduction from Molly and from Helen, and then we're going to jump in, you know, into a longer introduction with Yuka because she has other things to share with us that are very beautiful. And then we are going to go to a sort of ping pong questioning with Molly and Helen. So go ahead, Molly. Hi, everyone. I'm Molly, Molly Brown, and I did help, had the great, great, great pleasure and delight and honor of uh, co-authoring uh, Coming Back to Life with Joanna, who I just spoke with yesterday, as a matter of fact. and. Um, I live in 
what's called far Northern California because it's right up before the Oregon border. And I live in the mountains, uh, right in the lap of a huge volcano, Mount Shasta. And um, I'm a grandmother and uh, a wife of 60 years to the same man, believe it or not, who is wonderful. What else do I need to say? I guess that's all. I've been facilitating the work. Ah, that's it. Since 19... 92, I think, is when I started facilitating the work. So I'll pass it to Helen. All right. Thank you, Molly. Thank you, Sylvia. And welcome, everyone. And this is uh, Helen calling from Shanghai, China. Uh, so it's uh, 9.45 a.m. Right, uh, right here. Uh, it's great to connect this uh, this way and uh, I yeah I have a husband and kids <laughs> and my daughter is 15 years old you know the challenging uh, teenager time and I grew up in a coastal city it's not where I live now so my parents are still living in that uh, smaller but very beautiful coastal city and I look forward to talking and interacting with you more within the next couple of hours. Yeah, that's good about me for now. Over to you, Kat. Thank you, Helen. And before going to you, Kat, um, Helen and uh, Molly are weavers in the network. That's very important as well. Um, so weavers weave connections to other facilitators and to other organizations that are related to the world that we connect. Thank you. You can. It's all yours. Thank you. Okay. I would like to take this opportunity to introduce myself with some images. And thank you so much to, to Helen, Molly, Sylvia, and Kesley, uh, so, sorry, Kelsey, <laughs> uh, for allowing me to do it this way. And okay, in the next seven to eight minutes, I will share my story as a work that reconnects facilitator. And those who are participated, the work Wild Love for the World book club, please forgive me for repeating some parts. Okay, here is my slides. So I'll start. I was born in Japan half a century ago and the city of Kyoto, which used to be the capital of Japan from 794 to 1868, about for about a thousand years before Tokyo became the capital. There are still traditional ways of living vividly alive there in architecture, entertainment, crafts, customs, and even how people speak. One of my Many favorite exercises of the work that reconnects is called Seventh Generation, which invites people to feel and talk with future beings about 200 years from the present. Having grown up in Kyoto, it is not uncommon to find temples and shrines, restaurants, inns, and even small tofu or candy stores with 10th or 20th generation owners. So I was lucky that I could naturally cultivate a sense of deep time. For much of my life, I had little interest in, or I must say, no awareness of paying for the world. I was happy as long as I could keep going in my small world. The only things I was annoyed by were summers getting hotter and hotter, becoming unbearable to be outside during the day. Also typhoons became more and more intense, leaving more damage than before every time. But when summer passed, my peaceful days came back. It was like, well, everything changes, so does the climate. March 11th, 2011 was a life-changing point for me. I felt a faint tremor on that day, but Japan has earthquakes all the time, so it was nothing different from the usual common and normal quakes. But soon I realized it wasn't this time. 
To be honest, the scale of the disaster was beyond my comprehension. I understood that the nuclear power plant might explode, and if it did, it would be a big problem. But I couldn't understand the magnitude of it. A few days after the accident, comedy shows started to appear on TV again, as if everything was sort of over or soon to be over. So I got confused about what is true and real. There is destruction and pollution that will last for hundreds of thousands of years to come. On the other hand, the world around us continues to move as if nothing has happened. The following year, I got an opportunity to visit Joanna at her home in Berkeley. When she welcomed me at her entrance, I was surprised by her straight gaze and its gravitational pull. I felt as if I were glued to her earth-like blue eyes. She invited me to her kitchen, offered some tea and a snack. She told that she had been concerned about the accident at Fukushima. She wanted to know how people are doing, what has been going on in Japan, etc. As I was answering her questions, I could see tears welling up in her eyes and the edges of her eyes were turning red. Then there came a question that turned my heart inside out. She asked me, how are you feeling right now? What do you feel about what's going on in your country? I used to think everyone is different. So never saying no to anyone or anything is a form of kindness and nonviolent action. Of course, now I feel that's ridiculous, but anyway. So my answer to Joanna was like, I don't know what to say. I mean, I'm not in a position to say something about it. You know, it's not a good or bad thing. Some people are depending on the nuclear business to support their family. So, and I stopped. Joanna patiently waited to see if I wanted to continue to speak. And after making sure that no more words were coming out from my mouth, she gently asked again, what do you mean by that? I'm asking you how you feel. I'm not asking you what is right. Do you understand? I looked deep into my heart and got shocked because I couldn't find anything but fear. It's not fear for radiation. It's not even pain for people who are suffering. It was fear of telling the truth. What I found in my heart is me saying, I don't want to get involved in any issue where people need to take a stand. If I do, no matter which side I'm on, I will be criticized for my ideas or labeled as a judgmental person. It's safer to say nothing. Silence was my strategy to protect myself. To make it work, I needed to take my eyes off from the world. I needed to convince myself that there is no pain in this world so that I don't have to think about it. Cutting myself from the world cost more than I expected. Gradually, I lost my connection with my own deeper feelings. So there is no wonder why I couldn't answer Joanna how I felt. It's because I forgot how to feel my pain for the world. When I noticed this, I felt my heart being squeezed and my throat tightening. I felt hopeless, but fortunately, that realization was the first step to go back to the actively participate in the world again. I'll first forward a bit from this point. Since becoming a facilitator of the work that reconnects, I have worked with so many remarkable people. Let me tell you about one unforgettable workshop I did with the evacuees from Fukushima in 2016. When I was asked to facilitate the workshop, my first reaction was, Really? Me? Of course, I was very honored, and yet I was also terrified because I didn't know what I could say to them. The fear I had in my mind was the possibility of me hurting them without knowing it. I didn't want to be someone who comes from outside, knows nothing about their pain really, and yet talks like an expert. The more I wanted to be helpful to them, the stronger my hesitation became. 
a strong cowardice started forming in me. But I did it anyway. On the first day, after a brief greeting, we decided to build an altar and place our treasured items. Then each one introduced themselves and shared a story about the thing they brought to the altar. Most of the things came from Fukushima, one of a few th items they could bring. As the stories went, everyone in the room seemed to be sharing the pain. The collective grieving also helped me to touch my own pain and the cowardice I had in my heart softened. I realized that I was not an outsider and the pain I'm feeling was real. This realization freed me from the imaginary cell I created on my own. I felt myself more fluid, more resilient. And the book, Coming Back to Life, written by Joanna Macy and more Lee Young Brown, there is a phrase, truth telling is like oxygen. It enlivens us. Without it, we grow confused and numb. It is also homecoming bringing us back to a powerful connection and basic authority. I now know this is true. As the workshop progressed, the pain deepened. And yet, at the same time, I also began to feel the gushing heat of life in me. At the end of the workshop, we reflected on the time we had spent together. One person shared her surprise. To be honest, she said, when we began this workshop with open sentences on gratitude, at first I thought, I have nothing to be grateful for. I was angry, so I thought, how could I show appreciation for something while I'm dealing with so many hardships? But now, when I look back on these two days, I must admit that exercise changed my perspective. I'm still angry for what happened, but I can be also grateful for my life, my family, my friends, and, you know, so many things. Anger wasn't the only feeling I had in me, but I had forgotten about that. So I'm grateful for that. We all left. Okay, I'll stop now. Thank you for listening. Now let's hear from Helen and Molly. Thank you, Yuka. That was really, really um, a great introduction of how you came to the work and to the work itself. So thank you so much. Yes, and uh, let's, let's hear from Molly and Helen. Um, how did you come to the work? How you started facilitating? I, um, I uh, was introduced to actually InterHelp, which was one of the organizations that was doing before, long before it was called the Work to Reconnects. It was called Despair and Personal Power at that time, Despair and Empowerment Work. And I went to a conference of theirs or a conference, I guess it was a conference. And uh, these people were doing this weird stuff called despair work. And I, I was really kind of like, what's that? And uh, I really, I was having trouble relating to it, but at the same time, I was very taken by the people who were there and their openness and joyfulness, frankly. And um, so I, I was very intrigued, but then I didn't do anything more about that until a couple of years later, when I went to a workshop that on nuclear guardianship run by Joanna Macy. And I grew up in Los Alamos, New Mexico, where the uh, uh, first atomic bomb was actually designed and uh, created. So I felt I had a kind of a karmic responsibility to, uh, to deal with the aftermath and nuclear guardianship really rang a bell. Plus I fell in love with Joanna. So I, started going to those meet the meetings of that group. It was called the fire group, the poison fire group, and became more and more interested in the work. But really it was about nuclear guardianship. And then um, in 1991, I believe it was, I, um, or maybe it was 1990, I can't remember, 
um, I went to Star King School for the Ministry, which is a Unitarian Universalist seminary. And Joanna was teaching there, and she was teaching a course on deep ecology work, which is what she called it then. And I took that course. And that was the beginning of my connection to uh, the work that reconnects. And I started uh, giving workshops and going to as many workshops that Joanna was giving as I could. And um, so there was no training or anything in those days. It was just you went and you experienced the work and then you just started doing it, which is what I what I did. So that was my path to uh, being a facilitator. And um, I had the good fortune of actually co-facilitating workshops with Joanna herself, which was a great, a great wonderful thing. I'll say some more about that later. Um, I will let Helen speak now. Thank you, Molly. Sure, thank you. Thank you, Molly and Yuka. Um, I participated in my first face-to-face -face, uh, workshop back in 2019. Now, it was uh, like eye-opening experience for, uh, for myself. It was so in-depth. You know, I felt so connected with everyone in the group. And I felt connected with non-humans. Because before the workshop, I enjoyed watching you know, non-humans. You know, I enjoy, I still enjoy nature very much. I feel nourished in the nature, but I never thought about seeing things from you know, a leaves perspective, from a bird's. Uh, viewpoint uh, from the sky. So that was eye-opening for, uh, for myself and also uh, the, you know, the despair part, the you know, truth mandala. That was, wow. I was like, how could we do this? And together in front of everyone, you know, as the Chinese, my culture was like, uh, you know, pain, is for those who, who don't do good deeds. You know, they are kind of, you know, they, they, they deserve pain. And if you continue doing good deeds, you know, you'll be in perfect situation. You won't suffer from, from pain. So we tend to hide pain. Like I'm a good person, you know, I'm doing a lot of good deeds. I don't have any pain. So that was like, wow, yeah. So we can do this, not only, you know, as an individual and also as a group. Uh, however, you know, uh, after the uh, workshop, I didn't think I could do anything about it. Like, you know, it was too big. It was too heavy for me, you know, like who am I uh, that I can do this? So I didn't do much uh, apart from, you know, except for buying the two, the two, the two books. Oh, 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 anyway, coming back to life and uh, active hope because I wanted to, uh, you know, learn more. And, and then, you know, the, the, the COVID hit, I couldn't do what I was planning to, which was mainly face-to-face -face training, you know, uh, workshops. So we, you know, had to stay, uh, stay home. And a few coaches started talking about, you know, the workshop. Uh, we, we participated together. And then one of my friends and also my coach teachers, she saw an article written by uh, Dr. Chris Johnston, uh, the co-author with Joanna Macy of Active Book. And he wrote an article about going through the spiral with intent using open sentences. You know, at that critical time when we thought we didn't, you know, we couldn't do anything, we were like, oh, let's try it. So we turned that 10 minute thing into, uh, into a one hour, uh, no, two hour online experience going through the spiral. And that did a lot in terms of supporting ourselves. So we were suffering as well. It was 2020 uh, in the beginning. And also people 
through the difficult time. And we did over a hundred uh, online, you know, that kind of workshops in China, uh, outside China. So that, 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 that's where I started as a so-called facilitator uh, without, I guess, proper uh, facilitator training. But after that experience, you know, the more we do it, the more we think, oh, we can do more. So I participated in the facilitator development program with Molly and two other big teachers, Mutina and Constance. And I also participated in Deepening Active Hope program was uh, run by or initiated by uh, Dr. Chris Johnston. So then I started my kind of, uh, what, professional you know, uh, uh, journey to become a facilitator. Thank, Thank you, Helen. <laughs> Thank you, thank you so much. Okay, so now we're going to explore other questions with um, the two of you, Helen and Molly. And one, the, one of the questions is, you know, what is your niche? What, you know, do you have any particular um, public in your workshops or, or do you have any particular expertise that you apply to your workshops? And, you know, how, how is the work that reconnects unique for you? And the next question is, you know, how do you experience the word that reconnects in your own region or culture or language? Um, so Molly, maybe we start with you. And, and obviously you, you can talk about all the other things that you also do. Yeah. That. <laughs> well, uh, my niche right now is really the facility, well, two niches. One is the facilitator development program that Helen took part in and is actually taking part in again, she's, she's kind of um, shepherding a, a group of people from China through the program and being there as a support person for them. So, um, and that's just been incredibly exciting and satisfying. And uh, I can't think of anything I'd rather be doing at this point in my life. The other, the other thing is, uh, the Deep Times Journal. And in 2015, I went to a facilitator retreat with Joanna. And actually, I think that's where that film, that Elm Dance film was made, was at that, at that gathering. So I was looking for myself, seems. Am I in there somewhere? <laughs> anyway, um, and I came away from that with this strong, like, inner command you shall have a journal you shall create a journal it was very strong so i did and i have a wonderful team of people that work with me on it and we are about to put out a new issue uh on beyond patriarchy as our theme this time but um and i hope you all do see that and enjoy it and uh, there's a lot of help for facilitators. And we had an article a couple of times ago with, by Yuka about her work in, um, in working with Fukushima survivors. So um, it was a wonderful article, Yuka. It was so delightful. So how do I experience work that reconnects in my own region? It's kind of an interesting question because I live in a very small town in far Northern California. And I've done over the years, I've lived here for 18 years and I've probably done two or three workshops in that time. But what's happened is with COVID, we didn't think we could do the work online. We thought you had to be in person, but with COVID we couldn't do it in person anymore. And so we started doing it online and Helen started doing it online and found out, hey, it works. Maybe not quite as well as in person. And I wish we could, we can't do the Elm dance for one thing. But it's, it's uh, so right now, that's what I'm doing mostly is uh, working online, both with the facilitator program, but also uh, doing a five week series for people. And the great thing is you can work for people all over the world if you're online. 
So um, I don't know if that quite answers that question, but that's what comes up for me. Thank you, Molly. What about you, Helen? All right, yeah, my cheeks. One is uh, women, you know, as a woman, I kind of think I know, you know, what we, what we suffer from and how we are suffering and how we respond when we suffer. So I, I would like to uh, build and provide this space for women to, you know, to speak up, to tell the truth, you know, in response with uh, what Yuka just shared, telling the truth is, I think universally is very important and especially important in Asian countries because our culture doesn't really uh, uh, encourage, encourage that. And so, you know, generations by generations, we carry a lot of wounds, especially as mothers, you know, as women in this society. So that's my first thing to support myself and, you know, women. You know, just to, to live a real life, just to tell your true feelings about yourself and about the world, what's happening around you. And the, another uh, niche is kind of newly developed only over the past one year. Uh, you know, I've been working with some, uh, some special, what would we call the specialized organization, for example, the rare disease organization who support uh, those the rare diseased people uh, and also you know kids uh, who are you know abandoned by their uh, original family because of illness because of you know disableness uh, like organizations like like this I think the work that reconnects active hope can do a lot to support those people uh, as, as well, uh, in addition to, you know, the government organized staff. And how uh, we are doing in, in our language or region, in terms of forms, we are doing, uh, I guess, four things. One is the online thing I mentioned, and one is also online, ex uh, exercise-based. So especially after the, 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 in the general experience, if you like to do more, and we have specific exercise, like a uh, console of, you know, of all beings, so just in depth, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And we have, Molly mentioned, you know, the five week online, uh, like the full version of the workshop and also face-to-face -face as well. And also we're doing reading club. You know, we're translating the two books right now and meanwhile, we are doing, you know, uh, this reading. Thank you, Helen. Thank you, Helen. You're breaking up a little bit. <laughs> I think you're frozen. You're, you're frozen. Yeah, you're frozen. I don't know if you can hear us. Okay. Yeah, All right. Frozen. I saw that. Yeah, you're frozen. Okay, so, so let's change a little bit the, um, the, the questions because um, I think you can uh, take the spotlight. Can you do that? Are, are we going to do the third question, the third round? Yeah, I'm just because Helen, you know, was frozen. So perfect. Thank you. Um, okay, so we are going to do the third question now, and then we're going to go on a break, um, and we're going to come back to questions from those attending the webinar. And the third question, we're going to do that in a different way. So in, instead of being just Molly and Helen, it's going to be Molly, Helen, and Yuka. Yay! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the third question is um, is about the challenges. Like, what kind of challenges do you experience? as a facilitator, um, either now or in, you know, at the beginning when you started. And do you have any, um, any particular advice for emerging facilitators, people who are starting in this? 
So let's just start with you, Ka, and uh, and then we we'll go back to you, Molly. And I hope that you know we recover Helen soon. Okay. Uh, my challenge is I always feel that I'm not good enough, or I'm not an expert. And so one time I got an opportunity to talk about the systems view and how the world would look like through this systems view. And I was horrified because the audience there were sort of expert of this kind of systems thinking or business theory or kind of thing. So I emailed Joanna and said, Joanna, I have to do this, but I don't want to do this. What should I do? And, and what she said is, Yuka, you don't have to be an expert. And the role of the work that reconnects, so the role of the facilitator of work that reconnects is not an um, like expert. So what you have to do is just to create a space for the people to yeah, let them speak their truth. And the most important job for you is to be loved by the audience. And when I heard that, I thought, what? To be loved? It's the most difficult thing. But, and then she continued, and people love you not because you know everything. People love you because they feel they can tell their truth in front of you. So that's the job you have to do. So that's my answer. Mm. Wonderful. Shall I go on, Sylvia? Yes, yes, go. Okay. okay. It looks like Helen is still struggling to, to be with us. Um, well, one of the reasons I love doing the work is that I do not cry easily. I'm, uh, I, I don't let myself feel the pain, kind of like you were speaking of, Yuka, earlier. I, I put on a happy face. I, you know, I'm cheerful and all that. So doing the work has really helped me get in touch with my feelings. And sometimes when I'm facilitating, I, I kind of want to make it, make it easy for people. I don't, I don't want them to have to feel these strong feelings. And I, I kind of want to take care of them, protect them. And that's, of course, not very helpful. So, um, so I would say that's one of my challenges is, is really letting people feel the pain and express it and, and not, uh, you know, they're there now kind of thing to get them out of it. Um, another challenge I had early on, and this kind of goes into advice, um, is that because I was studying so closely with Joanna, I thought I had to do, I had to be a, a clone of Joanna. I had to be just like her and do the work just like she does. And I couldn't because I'm not Joanna. <laughs> and so this is sort of my advice to emerging facilitators is it's fine to admire someone who's a good facilitator and learn from them. But you have to find your own style. You have to find your own way. And it's good that you do so because we need variety. You know, that's in systems thinking, we learn that all the time that called requisite variety. We need variety. We don't all want to be just like Joanna. Um, as wonderful as she is, we need our wonderfulness to be there as well. So that was a challenge and also uh, my sense of 
advice. And we've lost Helen again. Oh, there she is. I'm back. I'm back. I apologize for my on and off state. I hope that doesn't disturb some of you. If the network somehow is not very stable or reliable today. So I, but I want to let you know I'm doing and trying my best. And if I disappear again, I'm with you. So what, what was the question, the challenge? Yeah, okay. So my number one challenge is my personal challenge. Like I, want, I wanted everyone to be in the workshop. I tend to let people know, hey, you need this, wake up, you know, there is this space, you know, you can do this and that. And of course, not everyone responds, you know, like, yes, I need it. Thank you. So that's my personal, uh, that's my number one personal challenge. You know, I need to manage myself, um, manage my own expectations, not just expectation. It's really my hope, like, hey, you know, this is good. But you know, we we are at different different points, different places. So yeah, that's number one. And number two, that's kind of a, a technical challenge. Just after the workshop, you know, what else could we do as a group? You know, we had a deep time there in the workshop for three days, for a few days. So what happens next? That's a challenge and also a, I think, an opportunity to, to us, you know, especially here in China. So what else, what, what, what more we could do? Uh, so that's in terms of a challenge. Uh, in terms of advice, I, you know, I'm still brain, I mean, new in this field, to be honest, you know, not less than three years. So my advice at this point would be, uh, do this as like you're doing this for yourself. So this is something you are doing from within. We're not doing this to save other people. We're not doing this to save the the world, you know, I'm doing this for, for myself and my hope is to support myself and people. So we are together. And the self-connection or connect with self is the first Oh, okay. We lost Helen again. Well, I'm sorry about that. Um, okay, so we are going to go to the next um, round, and this round is going to be questions from you. And Helen is going to come back, so don't worry, and we will be able to ask questions um, from her. What we are doing right now is a break, a five-minute break. And during the break, we're gonna stop recording, but you, if you are there um, after the break, you can start typing your questions in the chat. So we're gonna uh, do both questions that we collected uh, before the webinar, and we are going to collect um, live questions from you. So let's go for a break. We're gonna... Okay, so welcome back from the break. Um, and I'm technical difficulties that happen sometimes is the world that we live and it's the world of online. Um, we had a beautiful movement that was going to be guided by Helen, but because Helen is you know, freezing too much, we don't want to freeze with her. So we're gonna just you know, relax <laughs> and continue. And that's part of what we do as facilitators, right? We, we just move with the flow, whatever um, needs to happen whatever emerges. Okay, so I, I would like to first uh, go through some questions that came through the registrations. And then after that, it will be really nice to have questions from you all. Uh, this is a nice small group today. So I think we can 
collect many of the questions. So um, there is here one interesting question. It says, you know, could you offer some wisdom of suggestions about the best way to engage or offer the word that reconnects to people who are unfamiliar with the work and who may be very busy or, you know, just their mind is not there? Um, do you have any suggestions for those kind of groups? And that could be any one of you, not, not the three of you necessarily. So whoever has experience with that, if you have any wisdom about that question, maybe Molly or Yuka. Well, I could give my initial response. Um, Obviously, I, you know, in the description of the workshop, I try to indicate what the workshop's about, and it's an opportunity to talk about our, our pain for the world, and almost everyone feels it, and, you know, here's a chance to share it and, and um, in, a, in a supportive group. If someone says, like, oh, what do you want to do that for? I probably would just say, well, if it's not for you, it's not for you. Uh, I think it's really important to remember that we are not trying to like convert people to a new religion. We're offering something and so many people do respond to it that people who aren't ready for it, aren't ready for it. And so we move on. And so that's that's my response is, is you know, if, if it turns you on, great. And if it doesn't, that's okay too. Thank you, Molly. Yeah, that's important that it's not trying to sell or convince anybody of anything. And that leads to the next question that is similar to that, but not exactly. And people ask, you know, how, or what, what kind of words or what kind of language do you use when you are promoting uh, a workshop or an event of the world that we connect? Um, we can stop spotlighting Molly. Um, again, we can go to gallery, I think. Let's keep it gallery. It's a small group. Um, yeah, so what, what kind of words, um, what kind of language do you use? Um, because many people may not be familiar with what the word that we connect is, and sometimes, you know, doesn't necessarily reflect um, for many cultures, you know, what exactly it, it is. I, I wonder, you know, Yuka, if you have any experience, because, you know, the word that reconnects obviously sounds very differently in other languages. Mm -hmm. And it's translated exactly the same, or, you know, it's or worse, same as Helen. Oh, the language I use to describe this. Uh, one time I uh, named my workshop as a despair workshop and it scared people away <laughs> and organizer didn't like it. So, <laughs> um, but I, um, for the last maybe 10 years, I think I use more and more the exact word, the work that reconnects and translated in Japanese. So it, because it really is the work that reconnects, reconnects with ourselves, nature, world, planet, whatever it is. So I can't think of any other good word. Thank you. And there is another question here is um, that is related to um, you know, how you vet a facilitator or how you, um, if, if somebody asks you, because you are facilitators, but if you are, somebody asks you, and we receive that question a lot in the network, um, for example, can you recommend a facilitator? You know, we have this group and we want to hire a facilitator or to call a facilitator. So what would you suggest to an organization? You know, what are the the things to look for in a facilitator, and that can come from any one of you if you have that experience. Hmm. Hmm. 
<laughs> okay, I can help a little bit because okay. I have to answer the questions a lot in the network. Um, and then you can, you know, if you have anything else that you want to share, that will be great. Uh, I usually tell people, you know, well, it depends on many factors, you know, not all facilitators are good for all the groups. I, I would say that, you know, in, look at, you know, what kind of experience that facilitator has, you know, with, with uh, which kind of groups and whether the, the facilitator lives in that region or is familiar with the things that may be affecting that community or that, that type of group. That's one of the things. Um, and obviously have a conversation with the facilitator and, you know, have, have a conversation about what, what, is the, um, what is the approach from that facilitator? What is the experience that facilitator has? So it's, uh, it's a matter of knowing. And that leads to another question, which is, you know, how, how do you know whether you can facilitate a group or not? When somebody, you know, when, when, when you um, create a workshop, do you target your group workshop? Or if somebody asks you to create a workshop for them, what do you do? And that can be um, any one of you, Helen, Yuka, or Molly. Uh, I actually, oh, Yuka, go ahead, please. <laughs> Thank you, Molly. Okay. Uh, my answer is if it's on a targeted group, it's much easier to facilitate because I can know, I can tell what they're interested in. And most of the times they're already motivated. So, and if it's not targeted, but just want to try something new, it's uh, sometimes challenging. And in that case, I prepare the material beforehand with care and make it more digestible and understandable. That's what I would do. Thank you, Molly. And you? Uh, well, actually I heard two questions. One was, uh, how do you know that you're ready to do a workshop? And then the other one was, uh, how do you uh, tailor a workshop to a particular group. And uh, you answered that question very well. And I would just say, yeah. Um, how do you know that you're ready to do a workshop? If Maybe that wasn't the question you asked, but I thought I heard that. Um, and, and I just thought of what your, your story, Yuka, of you didn't think you were ready, but you did it anyway. And that would be my, my recommendation, do it anyway. You really can't do anything terribly wrong if you just kind of understand the spiral and you know, kind of the basics. It would be hard to, to make a really terrible mistake. And if you make a little mistake, you'll say, oh, okay, do it differently next time. And and be really open with the group that you're working with that you know and somebody is saying good night good night karina <laughs> thank you molly and yeah and that question leads to another one and is uh, i i see uh, a lot of people you know we had karina in ecuador and we have um alpia in the philippines and you know other people are asking questions about how do you start this work if you live in countries like Ecuador or Philippines where there are not facilitators or you know, there are not groups, and, but there's also no other people who are very familiar with the work. So how would you do that? What, what would you recommend um, in countries like that? And this is a very interesting question because the work is quite new in China and you and you know and Japan where you are, Helen and Yuka. So you can respond to that a little bit. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, I'll give it a try. Yeah, I've turned off my uh, camera, so hope it helps. You hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great, great. So, um, you're lucky if it's new in your country, because you are the first one in your territory to start to initiate this. Okay, that's the funny part. You know, you are the number one, you are the first uh, person. And then, you know, how, how, how could you uh, start this? Um, I guess there are a few ways. One is to start with people you know. You're like people around you. If you're at work, you know, you have work colleagues, you have friends, you know, you have classmates, course mates, et cetera, et cetera. You can start something with those people and then you know what you would like to do and how you would like to do this. So this is the most specific way. And then in a general way, uh, you could organize experience sharing. So to introduce this as a new thing and invite people over to try it out and to do this together. And then, then this message passes on, just like the reports, you know, it goes, it goes on, it goes out and touch uh, more people. Uh, and then I have to say, it is not easy, you know, new things start, it takes energy, it takes time, uh, it takes determination as, as, as well. But the feeling, if this is really something you love doing and you're devoting yourself to, the, the, you know, that is, the feeling is awesome. The rewarding feeling, the rewarding experience and with responses from people as, as well. Yeah. Thank you, Helen. Yuka, do you have anything to add to that? That's great, you know, that's great. Right. Okay, yeah, I'm having the same challenge. Um, right now I'm working with people in Myanmar and trying to bring this work to that country, especially young people in Myanmar. But the uh, work that we connect to is hardly known <laughs> anybody. So me and my team is now thinking about translating a book into memories and creating a book club around it. So let me show you the suggested readings here. If in your country, one of these books is translated into your language, you are lucky and I would do the book uh, club. And for example, I myself have been enjoying two online book clubs with Japanese friends, and it can be easily done with uh, in online settings. And one has been going on for over eight years and with 15 to 20 people meeting once a week for an hour. Over the years, we have read Active Hope, Word as Lover, Word as Self, and Coming Back to Life. And it's every Wednesday morning from 6 to 7 a.m., which enables people to participate before they go to work. And the other book club is also a weekly one with Japanese women in the East Bay where I'm living. And this has been going on for a year and a half on Wednesday nights from 8 to 9 p.m. And in both book groups, we are using a circle reading style. In other words, one person reads one paragraph and another person reads the next paragraph and so on. Then we stop at a certain point and share what arises in our hearts and minds. So in this way, it takes more than two years to read a whole book, but we can understand the books deeply. Also sense of community absolutely deepens. To me, a book club is like a sangha where people can gather together to learn and practice. And belonging to a community around the work that we connect where we can share our pain enables us to take on big problems we can't handle alone. People love it. So I highly recommend to create a book club. Thank you so much, Helen. That's a, that's a really great idea. Um, that also um, leads to another question that usually emerges because when people apply to become a facilitator, well, first I want to 
clarify, you know, becoming a facilitator of the world that reconnects is not something that is certified by Joanna or by anybody because the work itself is open source. So if you feel called to facilitate, you can facilitate. However, why there is an application to become a facilitator is more to help to keep the, you know, the roots of the, the, the work and the, the integrity of the work as it is. So otherwise, you know, anybody could call it the word that reconnects and be something different. But that leads to the question, and this is more for Molly, of when, when people participate in a book club, and I'm, I really appreciate what you say, Yuka, that you know, because you do it in such a way you know, over the years, it becomes really profound. So it's not just reading a book, it's, it's reading and also leaving the, the book and leaving the exercises. But the question is more about when, when you feel prepared and you apply, for example, to become a facilitator um, through the network, we have an application process. What else is needed there? What 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 else is you know important apart from the the skills, um, you know, knowing the topics and knowing uh, in the head, you know, what is the word that reconnects and what are the practices? So Molly, you may want to speak a little bit more about that. Sure, sure. And as you're saying, this is so it, so you can be listed on the network website it's uh you know and therefore you can advertise your events and everything so it's a way of, of kind of quality control in a sense um so we have three main requirements and so one is that you have experienced the work now it can be online because we're finding out that you can have really deep experiences online but it has to be the practices, not just listening to a, a lecture that Joanna gives or someone else gives. It has to actually be, you know, open sentences, truth mandala, seventh generation, some of the actual practices that you experience as a participant. So you know what it's like and you know what happens when you experience the work. So that's the first requirement. And then the second, well, we obviously want you to read the books. That's a wonderful picture. Um, read the books of, you know, Coming Back to Life and Active Hope. And incidentally, a new version, an updated version of Active Hope is coming out in June. So everybody look for it. Joanna is very excited about it. She thinks it's a big improvement over the previous one, which is wonderful too. Anyway, um, so that third requirement is that you actually have facilitated. So that means you have to have done something like Helen suggesting or Yuka suggesting uh, to facilitate your friends, a church group, whatever whatever number of people you can grab together. And of course, now you can do it also online. And um, if you have an online community that you can connect with, you can do that as well. So we want you to have actually facilitated as well. And we also are in the process of suggesting that everyone who facilitates needs to have some sort of experience with anti-racist, anti-oppression work. And it's going to be different in whatever part of the world you're in. But it's clear that there's problems with racism and classism and et cetera, sexism all over the world. And so it's a really good idea for facilitators to be uh, having some training or experience in working with various groups of people and so forth. And why do we have this picture on the, on the screen? Faye Adams Eaton is giving us this picture. Oh, I don't know. I, I don't have a picture. <laughs> it doesn't <laughs> for me. Maybe you have to go to the view and... Um... Yeah, it's gone now. You're yeah, back, okay. you're back. <laughs> uh, okay, so I think, I think I've answered that question. Thank you, Molly. That's an that's, uh, excellent response. 
Okay, and there is a last question from the questions that came before the, the webinar, and then we're going to start accepting questions from those attending right now. And the last question is about how you create community or how do you, uh, there's an, another question that is very related to that is how do you um, create a safe container um, for people to express their emotions? So there are two questions in one. So one is how do you create that community? And the other one is how do you create a container that feels safe for people to express those emotions? Any one of you, um, if you have that, could respond. And you can maybe this disconnects to something that you share at the beginning of, you know, um, mm -hmm. how culturally people feeling um, called to express, but, it, but that happens. So do you have any tips? Yeah, uh, well, no tips. Um, just like I said, uh, book club is a really good start. And I can show you one example, what kind of community emerged through one of my book club, <laughs> because I love images. Let me show you one image again. <laughs> so from one of this reading group, I sh shared my pain for the plastic pollution issues, especially in the ocean. So after I shared my pain around it, an idea of monthly beach cleanup was born. Since then, we have been doing it for a year. Of course, the scale of the plastic problem is so huge that we can't have a significant impact on the actual situation. But even though the situation seems the same, there is no doubt we have changed. So, and these people are reading the same book every week and they are now so into this work and really want to experience all the exercises together. And as one of the rituals, we do elm dance before or oh no, after the beach cleanup every time. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Yuka. Well, we're going to pass to questions from those attending the webinar. And before we go into those questions, I, I want to share that many of the resources and the things that you hear the facilitators uh, to mention, we are going to send that in a follow-up email and you will also be able to watch the recording, not just from this webinar, but from the webinar last week. Um, in that webinar, we had uh, three facilitators, one from India, one from Germany, and one, one from the US. And it was also an amazing webinar. Uh, we have over 200 people signing for the webinar. So um, I, I really encourage you to watch um, that one if you couldn't attend. So there was um, one question before I, I go over the questions from you. There was one question in the chat about why are not men as um, present in the world of Reconnects as facilitators as they are women? And yes, that's that's something that we have observed. But you know, we also observe that that is very similar in other environments. Um, and somebody responded that in the FTP, the facilitators um, development program that Molly mentioned, and I I linked in there in the chat. Um, there are actually quite a few men, so that that is changing. <laughs> That is there, there, there are quite a few men and people who identify differently too. So it's nice to see diversity. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. And um, that connects um, with the next issue of the Deep Times Journal, which Molly, um, you know, is, um, is the editor in chief and is going to, that, that is going to be launched at the end of March. And that issue is about, Molly? Well, beyond patriarchy, but actually there was an article written for a couple of issues ago that we said, no, we want to save this article. 
and use it as the sort of main article in uh, in this journal because it's about that very question. It's written by, it was actually a, the Vincent Brown's PhD dissertation. He did a study of men and the effects of, on men of participating in the work. And uh, it, it's just a fabulous uh, article. So I encourage you all to read it when it comes out. And it sort of gave us the whole idea of, of doing a whole issue on, we don't want to do it on patriarchy. We want to do it on getting beyond patriarchy. And I just hasten to say, patriarchy is not about men lording it over women. It's about hierarchy and men are as damaged by patriarchy as women are in different ways. So I just, it's not about men versus women. It's about any group of people lording it over anyone else. And um, it happens that in Western culture, that tends to be uh, fathers. It's patriarchy. It's father. It's not men. It's fathers. And, you know, the whole family structure and everything. Anyway, I just hasten, because sometimes people get defensive when they hear patriarchy. And it, it isn't Thank just you, about, Molly. yeah. Thank you, Molly. Yeah, so, um, so Andy clarified that he was asking um, about uh, why there are not that many men um, as participants. And I would say again that I have been in many workshops where there are plenty of men, but I think it's a matter of, a little bit of a matter of a cultural um, socialization that we are socialized to express more as women or those who identify as women than, than men or those who identify as men. So let's just start with the questions um, from you. And I know that some of you have already posted questions in the chat. I have tried to follow them and express some of them, but I wonder if there are other questions. And to ask the questions, you can raise your hand. We're quite a small group um, because some people have left, but it's still, I cannot see both screens. So you can raise your hand by going to reactions on the bottom of your screen. And there is a hand there that, and also it says raise hand. So Michelle, you want to go first? Thank you. <clears throat> um, hello from Tasmania, Australia. Um, I have great faith, I suppose, in the group process and in the, the, the process of the spiral and how it holds people and takes them through a journey that resolves. Um, but I suppose I'm, I'm left with a little fear that probably other people have expressed that what if um, we're upsetting people, you know, or giving people the chance to express emotions and they go away and they're upset by it. So I'm wondering if people have particular processes about following up with people or do we have a person who's tagged as the, the counsellor or the, you know, checking in with people during the workshop um, just so that we're leaving people in a safe way. Thank you, Michelle. So Molly, you can go. Yeah, I have a quick response and that is you need, really need to do the whole spiral. If you just did honouring our pain for the world and then let people go it, indeed they could go away and and you know go into despair or, or or depression or something so that's why it's so important to do the whole spiral now online we've been doing it on a week at a time and so we do honoring our pain one week and then we do uh you know seeing with new eyes the next week but it doesn't seem to have been a problem. And what we do is we just offer a lot of support. If there's any problems, please get in touch. And, you know, and, and it hasn't, and even at the end of the session, when we do honoring our pain, we say, if you need to stick around and talk about, you know, so we just provide a lot of support. And honestly, I've never had anyone, you know, go into a, some kind of, breakdown as a result of a workshop. It just, I think the work really does sustain people and getting it off their chest. They're feeling it anyway. 
they're, you're not making people feel anything they don't already feel. You're just helping them get in touch with it and express it in a supportive environment. That's really important. Thank you, Molly. I, I would add to that, Michelle, that if you're just starting, it's good to have a co-facilitator. Yes. Because a co-facilitator, mostly if you have a very big group, the co-facilitator can go to with a person who is, you know, and, and also know, try to know the people that you're working with, because if somebody has any other issues that, you know, are not necessarily related to the work that you're doing, that are, you know, they, they have like mental health issues or, you know, any other issues that are being triggered. So having a co-facilitator helps because you can continue with the group and you can have somebody uh, taking care of them. And I, I also would say, um, you know, what Molly mentioned, you know, preparing people, knowing that they are going to go through an exercise and preparing and giving people some tools like breathing through and, you know, other preparations, not just jumping into the practice. Okay, any other questions, Susan? You're muted, Susan. Got it, okay, yeah. Um, concerning what you just said um, and about about knowing, knowing kind of who you're working with in the group to whatever extent you're able, I guess. I attended the previous session of um, emerging facilitators and, and one of the facilitators was talking about providing a questionnaire prior to the workshop with specifically targeted questions that she developed so that she could understand A, what, um, you know, what practices might be most appropriate within that group setting? Of course, you're gonna get different answers from different people participating. So you've got to make judgment calls, but then um, it just kind of, is that a common um, practice? Like for the facilitators on the call tonight, do you provide war, um, questionnaires for, for people that are participating prior often or, or rarely, or how do you go about sort of understanding who you're working with so that you can prepare appropriately prior to the session? It's kind of, that's, is that, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. Okay. Molly, do you want to answer that? Or I don't know if you can. Well, let, let's have Yuka or Helen answer. Is Helen still with us? Yeah. Helen? I am online, but the question was breaking up for me. So I actually didn't follow the question. Okay. Um, Anna, I'll you can? Okay. Mm -hmm. I never thought about it, <laughs> but it might be interesting um, to focus my intention. But usually I don't have this pre uh, questionnaire thing. Thank you. Molly, you have. Yeah, I, I've never experience. done it. Mm -hmm. I've never done it. Uh, for the facilitator development program, we have an application and we do ask a lot of questions there, but that's because we want to, you know, determine if a person has had experience with the work before they start training to become a facilitator. But no, I, I, I haven't done that. I think it's an interesting idea. I might. I might start doing that. I haven't done it till now. I, I can share a little bit of my, my experience because they were with refugees. I do it, you know, and I, in my case, it's very important to know what people have been going through um, to select the practices and, you know, and to prepare the group. And as a participant myself, I have experienced also um, not just questionnaires, but also a material that was sent to me prior to a week-long retreat on the World that Reconnects. And probably because, you know, when you go to a retreat that is so long, and that was pre-COVID, obviously, <laughs> um, when you go to a retreat that is so long, you are going to be really deep into the practices. So, so that can trigger, and you know, many different things. So we were actually very well prepared, not just the questionnaire, but also 
things to read and things to watch before even going to the retreat. Great, any other questions? So we have a, a question actually in the chat, very interesting if the facilitating program prepares to facilitate processes with children. There are many children with pain in the world to, um, you know, and awaken. Well, Molly, you, you may want to respond to that because you run the FTP. Um, we don't have specific instructions about that, but often people participating in the program are interested in working with children and they have many opportunities to talk about it together and what they're out, you know, what the applications were. So, you know, there, there certainly isn't any formula that we could give you, uh, you know, this is what you do or this is what you don't do, but um, it, you know, obviously you have to adapt the work we're working with children, but anyone working with children would probably know how to adapt the work <laughs> because you're working with kids. So uh, I've worked with teenagers. I haven't worked with small children. And teenagers uh, love this stuff. At least the ones I've worked with. Thank you, Molly. Okay, so we have uh, a few more minutes. We're um, open for questions. Anybody else has any questions or the panelists or any questions at all? I'm trying to remember. I think I saw some quest questions yeah. in the list that I thought were interesting, but we may have covered them already. Yeah, and some of the questions were covered in the last webinar that was uh, very well attended. June, um, you have a question. I think I know the answer to this, but um, in the the promotional um, blurb that that you put for these these question and answer sessions, um, you, there it was commented that you often get requests for people to come and facilitate um, the work that reconnects, and I'm noticing that there were already were a couple people, one from Ecuador and one from. I think the Philippines just in this group that are interested in having um, like a mentor or having some way of bringing the work to their communities. And so I'd love to hear a little bit more about when someone makes a request about bringing a facilitator in, what's the process? And, and then I'm presuming that somebody that would be referred would have to be, um, already have applied for what Molly was talking about, like applied to be, um, it's open source, but on the other hand, you can, you can get um, approval. I, that's not the right word, but where you, you have the three criteria that you have to meet. So I'd love to hear just a little bit about how how that all works, and especially wanting to attend to the people on this call from Ecuador and from Philippines who are interested in getting some support and mentorship. Thank you. Thank you, Jun. I, I can speak a little bit to that if, if you don't mind, Molly. No, please do. Yeah, so we have a network. So the network was something that emerged um, naturally. It's not necessarily a regulatory body. Is just, you know, all of us are facilitators of the world that reconnects and all of us know the, the world that reconnects deeply. And the network is actually all of you, all of you attending this call and, you know, the, the call last week, because just being, you know, interested or being facilitating or, or reading about the world that reconnects makes you part of the network. So going back to your question, yes, the work itself is open source. And the reason that you know, there is a, a path is because the network offers facilitators who want to be in the network 
offers the opportunity to you know, present their work to the to the world through the network. The network has more, um, you know, can, can approach to more people. So it's is you know seen everywhere in the world. So it has a website and has social media and other mechanisms. So it's a matter of you know putting our all our strengths together so so we can help each other right so so when you apply to become a facilitator is is a matter of okay do you really have the experience and have you read read the books and you know and then one of the things that we are doing in the network um and this is for emerging facilitator this is one of the things you know starting with these webinars to offer facilitators or people who are sitting on you know in they're, they're not necessarily there yet. They want to be facilitators, but they don't know if they are ready. They don't know if, you know, what are the next steps to offer them these uh, options to first to meet with facilitators, both, uh, you know, a very experienced facilitator like Molly and, you know, newer facilitators like Helen, who can share their experiences and who, not necessarily a one-on-one, -on -one, but they are becoming mentors through these calls. We have the plan to have a cafe that, you know, an ongoing cafe where people can come and join and ask questions and share things and, you know, review things. Um, that will be great um, if, you know, we can come with that um, very soon. And we are also planning to have a mentorship program. So we work a lot uh, with volunteers and you know other facilitators who come with ideas and we create those programs and those are super programs. So I I think we will have that opportunity very soon to offer you know that mentorship. This was actually an idea that emerged from the network because we were aware that there are so many facilitators in so many regions in the world that don't have access to programs for them, um, other facilitators or networks. So thank you for that question, June. And yes, we, we will continue with all of you um, supporting that. Could I add something, Sylvia? Yes. Uh, and that is because we have discovered that you can do the work that reconnects online. Um, if you're in a place where there's, you know, hardly anybody knows about the work or and there are no other facilitators you could ask someone you could you know go online look at the facilitators that are listed and ask someone please uh you know help me and you know or put out a call saying i'm looking for someone to facilitate a workshop in the philippines or wherever you are and i'll bet you'll find someone I'll bet you'll find someone who would be willing to, to work with you as a co-facilitator and help get you going. I would like to add one more. <laughs> I would like to share my episode with Joanna. And so I was on a facilitator training program with her several years ago. And it was on a three day uh, once a month for six months period. And we were people of 12. And one day, one person asked Joanna, what do you think if someone who has never worked with you starts um, facilitating the workshop with other people? And she was thinking, she didn't, answer to that question right away, but she was thinking a bit and said, that's okay, that's okay with me. And because there are people who cannot afford the workshop or who can't come to my workshop because of their family situations or financial situations or other situations, um, I know that. So that's why I wrote this book, Coming Back to Life with Molly. And yet, it's really important to know the thoughts around the practices. And then when I started facilitating the work, I found 
the difficult thing is not just giving an instruction. Actually, the facilitating the practice is the easiest part if you mm -hmm. have a book. But how to connect one practice to next one? This sway time is the most difficult part. And that's the thing you want to learn as a facilitator, probably. And taking a facilitator developing a course is exactly for this purpose. And it, it's like, this is a practice. So that's why it's like a yoga. When you practice yoga, you can do it with YouTube. But when you have an instructor beside you, you know which muscle should be extended, should be twisted or something like that. And it's more effective and you have more confidence in what you are doing. So both ways it's good, but it's your choice though. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Yuka. That, that was great. Yeah. I hope that, you know, we don't twist too many muscles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So we have um, time for, you know, one or two last questions and then we're going to close. Um, any other questions is you, you can speak up or you can also post your question in the chat. I see many comments in the chats, but not necessarily more questions. And Kelsey, if you have seen any question that I have missed that is important, let me know. There is a question from Jill in the chat. From Jill, okay. Um, are there models, some models, facilitators, merging facilitators within a local community working or networking together. Are you, are you asking whether there are specific communities with facilitators or can you clarify it, Jill? Um, yes, uh, I'm just aware of some communities like Montreal and Ontario, Canada, for example, have quite a network of facilitators working together and meeting themselves. And, um, and I would like to see that where I live. Um, I know there are many others um, who have experienced Joanna's work. And so I just wonder if there's models of how to, um, or um, how to, um, move that forward um, to consider it, um, not reinvent that. I mean, yeah. Just like uh, uh, support, like from, from communities. And I'm thinking regional, local. I know that we're mm -hmm. global and inter, um, online, but we have specific local needs and, um, and how we can work together and- yeah. um, yeah, so just yeah, a new model or articles or um, commentary on that happening. Yeah, thank you. Well, in I, I think it was in 2019, Molly, that we did the, the gathering, the gatherings, yeah. So right. in, 2000, yeah, in 2019, we encourage uh, facilitators from all over the world to do some for the Reconnect gatherings. And that, that actually sprouted many, many communities of so facilitators and people who were close to the work in different parts of the, you know, the planet. And we heard from some of them, uh, some of the ones that you have mentioned, Jill, for example, I live in British Columbia and there is, you know, a big um, sub network here. And the reason we are a network is because networks are made of you know, other networks and other hubs. So we're not necessarily the network and the only one, and we don't want to be that either. We just, you know, emerge and we are representing and we're trying to share the different networks that are happening around the world. There, there are networks in friend, uh, France, um, there are networks in Latin America, there are networks, you know, emerging, you know, in Asia. So, so there are many different, communities that are emerging because you're right, you know, the, the needs and the culture, the language may be very specific for that particular network. Yeah, so thank you for asking that. And Sylvia, there's a really good question in the chat right now from uh, Althea. 
-hmm. Is there a chat group for Work That Reconnects Global or Regional? And she gives an example of some, some platforms that are helpful. And you have an answer for that, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, I'm not supposed to be the, the interview <laughs> interviewee, but the interviewer today. But um, yeah, I, I know that because we are working on that. So we are working on a new website. Um, and in the new website, we will have um, you know, a wider network, but the current website, even when it's not perfect, actually has a forum. And in that forum, you can, you know, you can join once you become a member. You don't need to be a facilitator. You can be a member, just a member. And you can be part of that forum and start, you know, conversations in that forum with other people and find people from your own region. So that's one of the, the ways that you can communicate. They are not necessarily in Discord or um, WhatsApp. We, we don't have that, you know, those channels, but as any networks, you know, that can emerge. So don't, don't ask for permission. We don't have to give you permission. We are not, <laughs> we're just a network of other facilitators like you. So um, if you find other facilitators and you want to start a group in your language, in your region, you know, go ahead and, you know, if you want to share with us so others can know that you exist, that, that's great. Um, so thank you for that. There was another question there about Latin America from Karina. Karina, um, do you mean that if the group that is facilitating the work in Latin America is the only group? Is that what you're asking? Hi, I know. You're still there? Yeah? Yes. Is that is the same program I have to take if, even if I am from Latin America? I mean... Is there a facilitating program for Latin America people from this network work that they connect in Spanish? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'll clarify the difference. So the network is the network. Um, like I say, it's a network, network of facilitators and followers of the work. The network itself doesn't have any program, um, you know, or any, any doesn't have any, any program. We are not an educational program. We don't have a facilitators program. The program that we were referring to happens to be with Molly and other two facilitators who are not here right now. And that's a, you know, that's their program. And they are very experienced facilitators and they offer a program to develop facilitation. But there are other programs in the world. For example, there is a program in Europe and there is a program, very good program that is managed um, by uh, Adrian, Adrian Villaseñor. Uh, he's from Mexico, he is also in the United States and he's in Spanish. So you can connect with me if you, if you need more um, information about that. But yeah, it's exactly the same word that we connect, it's just in Spanish. And he actually translated uh, Molly and Joanna's book into Spanish. And we are providing that for free in the network as well, if you, if you need it. I don't know if that answers. Yes. Okay. I I mean, I highly recommend that program. Everything I've heard about it is is just really excellent. And uh, Adrian is just an amazing. He wrote an article for the very first journal uh, edition of the Deep Times Journal. He's just an amazing person and deep thinker. So recommend it highly. Okay, so we are actually at the end of the webinar right now. So I would like to thank and everybody and thank you for joining us from so many countries and so many places in the world. And we will continue offering this type of webinars for facilitators and emerging facilitators. And we would like to see you in the network as well. So if you're not a member of the network, you know, consider joining the network. Uh, you, the, the joining of the network requires um, a small fee that you can choose from $5 a year or anything. But if that is, um, is a problem for you, just email me. And um, I don't know, Kelsey, if you can put the email from the network, the admin, um, email so they can email me and 
we we will figure that out you know that's not a problem for us um so another thing is in the network we also offer uh, webinars and events from other facilitators in the world so if you haven't experienced the work or if you want to gain more experience we encourage you to visit the events and select an event that you know speaks to you either the language you know the facilitator the type of event there are so many events right now um, that are online that actually uh, can be taken from almost anywhere in and I also will follow up with an email and I will share with you some of the resources that we talk about and you know some of the questions so you can go further. And I will be sending the recording for today and for um, the last week's webinar. So thank you so much. Um, thank you so much for everybody for attending. And Molly, we're going to play the Mug Muse song. Yes, go ahead. Thank you uh, for this, reminding me that. Yeah, this is uh, the Thrive East Bay Choir. Uh, that is East Bay uh, near the San Francisco of uh, East Bay, performing a Ma Muse song, which is called um, "We Shall Be Known." Anyway, you'll hear the lyrics. You'll love it. You'll know why we want to play it as our closing. We shall be. Your eyes are oh, going to no. look oh, no. years and years younger in two minutes. Two minutes. Get bad. Get so bad. horrible. Get bad. Yeah. We shall be known by the company we keep, by the ones who circle round to tend these fires. We shall be known by the ones who sow and reap the seeds of change alive from deep within the earth it is time now it is time now that we thrive it is time we lead ourselves into the well it is time now and what a time to be alive in this great turning we shall learn to lead in the shall be known by the company we keep by the ones who circle round to tend these fires we shall be known by the ones who sow and reap the seeds of change alive from deep within the earth who circle round to tend these fires. We shall be known by the ones who sow and reap the seeds of change alive from deep within the earth. It is time now, it is time now that we thrive. It is time we lead ourselves into the way
Thank you. Thank you, everybody. And I, I saw the messages. I'm going to share the link to the song uh, in the follow-up email. Okay. And yes, it can be found in the internet. Thank you so much. Thank you. You can type a word or say a word, you know, um, to say goodbye.